Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Reading Veterans Day 2022. What a beautiful day. Thanks, Father Rock, for those prayers. My name is Will Vallier, and I'm the Veterans Service Officer for the town of Reading. I've been here since June of 2022, after the retirement of Kevin Bowmiller, who is now enjoying his retired retirement across the pond in the Republic of Ireland. So, Today we are gathered here to honor seven men of Reading who made the ultimate sacrifice in preserving our freedoms in the Republic of Vietnam. We are also paying tribute to all the men and women of Reading who served in the armed forces during the Vietnam War. This morning, I would like to recognize our straight representative, Bradley Jones, Select Board Chairman Mark Doxer, Vice Chair Karen Herrick, and all the other Select Board members who have joined us here today. Thank you. In addition, I would also like to recognize Fidel Maltz, our town manager, town Reading, and members of the Reading School Committee. Unfortunately, Superintendent of Schools Tom Milichewski could not be here today, but in his place, we're going to have uh, Assistant Principal Jesse Terrot to be up to the podium to say a few words. We also are privileged to have with us the Michael L. Fabry of Middlesex County Veterans Treatment Court, Framingham, Massachusetts. He's the gentleman back in the green fatigues. He is the Honorable Michael L. Fabry of the Veterans Treatment Court. I work with him at the Veterans Treatment Court. Thank you, Your Honor, for coming. Appreciate it. <laughs> Lastly, and most importantly, I want to welcome the Gold Star families, all of Vietnam veterans and the veterans of all eras who honor us with their presence today. Father Rock. Let us pray. Almighty God, creator and sustainer of all life, we ask that your blessing may descend upon us as we gather today to dedicate this Vietnam Memorial in honor of the seven young Reading men who gave the ultimate sacrifice in a land far away. We thank you for this opportunity to once more in freedom honor not only these seven, but also all our veterans who have served to keep us free. May we never forget those who made the supreme sacrifice so as to secure for our nation the blessings of life, liberty, and justice for all. May our observance be a timely reminder that our freedom was purchased at a high cost and should not be taken for granted. Bless the families and friends of those we honor today and bless the veterans who have come with memories, stories, and tears that enrich this day. In your holy name we pray, amen. Thank you, Father Rock. Father Rock is also a retired Navy chaplain of 30 years, Vietnam veteran. Thank you. Please rise. Remain standing for the presentation of the colors. At this time, I'd like to introduce you, our town manager, Fidel Maltz. Good morning, wow. What a day today. The, uh, uh, not only all of you, but the weather uh, has, has certainly cooperated and stayed away. Uh, on behalf of the, the town of Reading, uh, I want to say, Thank you foremost uh, to all the veterans and all the families uh, who are here today. Um, I also wanted to say thank you uh, uh, to everyone who participated uh, in, in the incredible memorial that is behind you. Uh, it, it, it certainly took a lot, of, uh, a lot of work and a lot of effort, uh, and, and, and we are so very happy to be here with you today. Thank you. Thank you for those words. Representing the school and school committee to speak is Jesse Tewa. She'll say a few words. Jesse. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. 
My name is Jessica Terrio, and I am an assistant principal here at Reading Memorial High School. What most do not know about me is I am a military veteran and have had many veterans in my family. Working in a Memorial High School means a great deal to me, and I would like to explain to you why. My grandfather was in the Army during World War II, and I've heard stories that he was a prisoner of war who escaped, but I don't know the truth. My uncle was a B-17 pilot in World War II in the Army Air Corps and earned the Purple Heart. His plane was under fire. He was shot in the knee. Most of his crew was killed, but he was able to land safely, and both he and a few survived that horrific flight. I never saw his Purple Heart. I wish I did, but it did not matter to him, and it's long lost now. I never asked him about it, and I never asked him about that flight. There are certain things you just don't ask a veteran. However, he and I talked extensively about flying, especially when I was becoming a pilot myself. I left home at 17 in 1991, and I went into the United States Air Force during the Gulf War. After basic training in Texas and more training in Mississippi, I ended up stationed at F.E. Warren Air Force Base in Cheyenne, Wyoming where I met my husband. We served the rest of our military careers together, both in Wyoming and at Otis Air National Guard Base here in Massachusetts. We are now beginning the wind down of our careers. Mine as an educator, his as a firefighter. He is a quiet man, very private and very humble, just like the rest of his family. He will never tell anyone that he earned the Medal of Valor for a very horrific call that he worked years ago where he saved a girl whose mother tried to kill her. That medal does not matter to him and sits hidden away in a drawer collecting dust. In the 90s, I began to develop strong relationships with his family. And I began to understand his quiet, humble, and reserved nature even more. All of the men in his family were veterans. His grandfather was a World War II radio operator who survived eight invasions in the South Pacific. He was a very strong man who shared his stories with my husband, and they live on through him. Around the same time, my stepfather became a significant part of my life. He was a Vietnam veteran who spent eight years in the jungle. My stepdad told me many stories, showed me many pictures, souvenirs he brought back. He would try to teach me words in Vietnamese any chance he could get, usually when we were out to dinner in a restaurant and I'd be horrified as he'd be teasing the workers, telling them in their language that I had no money. <laughs> that was fun. Life in Vietnam changed him and changed his mind, but at times he still had a great sense of humor. My father-in-law was also in Vietnam. He was a Marine, infantry. He endured significant psychological trauma from close combat, being ambushed and attacked over and over again. When I looked into his eyes, I saw the horror of his memories staring back at me. I have read his files from the VA and cannot fathom enduring what he did. My husband's uncles, both combat veterans in Vietnam, were also infantry, one army, one Marine. They shared many stories with me of what their lives were like fighting that war. The stories are chilling, horrifying, and ones I will not ever share. I have sat with these men and seen them flinch and shake when a car backfires, when loud pops happen on the 4th of July, their eyes filled with pure terror. The flashbacks they have are real and haunting. My sacrifice was very small compared to what the men in my family have given. They did not serve to earn medals. Their medals sit hidden away, dusty, usually forgotten. They served to honor our country and to protect the freedoms we all have Freedoms some take for granted. Each day when I come into this school, I walk by this memorial wall behind me. I love this wall. Every time I pass it, I give pause to think about those who have paved the way before me, who served so that I could be free to be me. This memorial stirs in me the love for my country, for our flag, for my fellow veterans, and for their sacrifice. Once I step through the doors to this school, I notice all the plaques on the walls honoring Redding's veterans, 
All summer, I have been watching this Vietnam Memorial being built. Over the past few days, it took some of my intense military strength to not unwrap the blue tarp like a Christmas present to see it. It's been a long summer. Today is the day I have seen it for the first time, and it is beautiful. Now when I arrive each day to serve this community, I will think of my family, the men who sacrificed so much, their minds, their lives, men who endured the horrors of the Vietnam War. Each day I will look at this memorial and say thank you and hope they can hear me. Only one remains. To the veterans here today, you know the instant bond that we feel when we first meet. It is a sacred thing that we all understand and share together that civilians will never know. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for paving the way for me. Thank you for serving our country. Thank you for being brave. Thank you for being a role model. I will be watching out my office window, which is right over there, to see who shows up to this monument. If you do, I may just stroll on out to take a break and sit with you for a while. As you go about this Veterans Day, please think about the stories that may be in your own family. How might they be connected to this monument? Thank you for showing up today. Thank you to everyone who made this monument possible. It is perfect. Have a peaceful Veterans Day. Thank you for those words, Assistant Principal Tefferl. I will get it right one of these days. Don't get it either. Uh, you can give me detention, I guess. I don't. <laughs> okay. Next uh, uh, up at the podium would be Chairman Mark Doxer. Thank you, Will. Good morning, folks. It is my honor and privilege to be able to read a proclamation from the Governor and Lieutenant Governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Proclamation, whereas since the Commonwealth's colonial days, thousands of men and women have served our country in defense of freedom and liberty. And whereas on November 11th, 1918, the armistice was signed in the forest of Compiègne by the Allied Nations and Germany, ending World War I, the war to end all wars after four years of conflict. And whereas since that day, every November, people from around the nation have gathered to honor our veterans. And whereas there are approximately 300,000 veterans living in Massachusetts. And whereas today we are reminded of the great sacrifices and contributions our veterans have made to our country. And whereas we honor and salute those who served our country throughout the generations with honor, patriotism, and courage. And whereas it is appropriate that all Massachusetts citizens remember the bravery of those who serve their country so that their dedication and sacrifices serve as a reminder of the cost of our freedom. And whereas in November 2022, the world will commemorate the 104th anniversary of the armistice that ended the fighting in World War I at 11 a.m. November 11, 1918 the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. Now, therefore, I, Charles D. Baker, Governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, do hereby proclaim November 11th, 2022 to be Veterans Day and urge all the citizens of the Commonwealth to take cognizance of this event and participate fittingly in its observance. Given at the Executive Chamber in Boston this 11th day of November, in the year 2022 and of the independence of the United States of America, the 246th. Signed, Charlie Baker, Governor of the Commonwealth, Karen Polito, Lieutenant Governor, William Galvin, Secretary of the Commonwealth. God save the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Thank you, uh, Chairman Doxer. Next, I would like to introduce you House Minority Leader, State Representative Bradley Jones, who will read a House <coughs> resolution of the House of Representatives. Thank you and good morning. good morning. To our veterans here today, thank you. To our Vietnam veterans, thank you and welcome home. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the House of Representatives. Be it hereby known to all that the Massachusetts House of Representatives 
Officer, sincerest congratulations to the veterans of Reading, Massachusetts. In recognition of the dedication of the Vietnam Memorial to recognize the service of all Vietnam veterans who answered the call to arms from the town of Reading, including Bruce C. Parmalee, Peter M. Bradbury, Robert J. Croce, John W. Hanscom, Michael D. Havel, Robert A. Holt, and Edward A. Putney, whose selflessness, courage, and sacrifices serve as a reminder of the cost of our freedom. That the entire membership extends its very best wishes and expresses the hope for future good fortune and continued success in all endeavors. Signed by Richard Haggerty, myself, Speaker of the House Ron Mariano, and given this 11th day of November, 2022. Congratulations on this outstanding event and this outstanding memorial. And again, thank you for your service. At this time, I'd like you to please welcome Executive Director of Home Base and Ready Memorial High School graduate of 1979, Brigadier General, retired, Jack Hammond. Before I begin my remarks, I just want to thank the members of this memorial committee that helped pull this all together. Um, as, you, as you can imagine, this is not an easy thing to kind of um, pull a group of people together during the height of the pandemic, et cetera, but it was a labor of love for each of us. And so it began with Kevin Bowmiller, who's now happily drinking Guinness in Ireland. <laughs> uh, we're a little envious of him. Um, but I'd also like to thank Captain Bill Hughes, who was out here at uh, 9 o'clock this morning blowing the leaves off the memorial to make sure everything was just so. Um, Will Valeri, who came in behind Kevin to help bring this all together. Uh, Jenna, uh, Mr. Bill Brown uh, from the Memorial Committee that helped make this all a reality. And of course, Dave uh, DiFilippo, who actually built us the memorial and gave us a good price. <laughs> Having returned to Reading after three decades in the Army, I, I was a little troubled to see that we really didn't have that, that appropriate level of recognition for our Vietnam veterans. And, and I'll, I'll explain more on, on the impact on me personally as, as a young soldier. Um, and I met with Kevin, and, and I had a quick conversation. And, and you never know how things are going to go when you say, hey, I want to do something. Because you can run headwinds into bureaucracy, et cetera. But I just want everyone to understand, from the minute from the first conversation, from the second conversation, third conversation, we didn't hit a bit of headwind. Everybody in the town, uh, from Felix, the committee, the school committee, Kevin, it was yes. It was yes. And then how do we do it? Never once. Everybody knew it was the right thing to do. And as I, as I shared with my grandson Wyatt a moment ago, it's never the wrong time to do the right thing. And the town really pulled through um, to make this a very, very special day, as you can see. This is, a, this is a pretty spectacular um, moment for me to come back to my old high school um, on this auspicious, auspicious occasion as a proud alumni and a veteran to see my town come together for our Vietnam veterans in the, in the way we all have. It said that poor is a nation that has no heroes, but shameful is the nation that has them and fails to honor them and recognize them. We're here today to make sure that doesn't happen. I'm really happy to see so many young people here, and that's our future, and that plays a big role of it, and it shows what a community Reading has, and for many of our older veterans here that grew up here, as Bill would say, he's hung around here for 90 years, <laughs> it's the same town, it's the same people, it's that same sense of community. And in recognition of the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War, our town, its leaders, and its people made a comprehensive decision to move forward with this beautiful memorial. It is a bittersweet moment uh, to this dedication because, number one, it, it is long overdue. And many, unfortunately, of our Vietnam vets have passed since returning home and, and are not possible to be with us. Uh, moreover, we are taking time to honor uh, seven men who made the supreme sacrifice, and that is both right and proper, especially here on Veterans Day. As a young and less than stellar student here at RMHS, and I already shared with our, the assistant principal is much nicer than any ones I ran into. <laughs> I grew up in a very patriotic family. I had four uncles serve during World War II. Uh, my uncle Jerry Underwood, who also lived in Reading for many, many years, served in Korea and two tours of Vietnam, and I spent time with them over the summers overseas. Um, 
But I grew up during the Vietnam War, and sadly, I, I did not pay as much attention as I should have as a young kid. And my focus was on sports, social life, my future, as I attended Joshua Eaton and Parker Junior High in the late early 60s and early 70s. And I was, I was oblivious to the anxiety and stress of the older kids in high school at that time, waiting to see if their number truly came up. It was not until I turned 18 and registered for the draft myself that I had that sense of feeling. And the draft was not in place anymore. We all registered, but there was no draft. But still, when you sign that paper, you just get a sense of that feeling. And then a short time later, as a, as a um, young man, when I enlisted in the Army and swore my oath to defend this country, I, I, I thought about that again. As a young lieutenant in the early 1980s, I had a lot of Vietnam um, uh, service members, Vietnam veterans that I worked with and served under. Uh, company commanders, battalion commanders, platoon sergeants, squad leaders that I worked with that trained and molded me as a young officer. Um, they passed the lessons on that they learned from the soldiers that came before them. And that's what we've done for hundreds of years here in America. I would like to share that uh, one of my best friends in the United States Army, closest, closest comrades, um, served with me in Fallujah in, in 2003. Uh, was a young man um, of 17 when he enlisted in the Army and served his two tours in Vietnam, went on to serve in the Gulf War. And this legacy of knowledge that gets passed on from one generation to the next continues. And, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll share how the coaches got involved with us and, and trained us, because my coaches growing up, many of them served in World War II and in Vietnam. In preparing for today, um, my good friend, Captain Bill Hughes, uh, who's a Desert Storm veteran from the Marine Corps, led our efforts to look into the backgrounds of the seven young men who you see behind us here, um, young men from Reading who made the ultimate sacrifice, and we attempted to connect with as many of their families as we could. We felt it was important to learn more about their stories and bring them to life again. We learned that PFC Bruce Parmalee, who had been wounded um, by shrapnel, refused medical attention and exposed himself to further enemy fire so he could care for a wounded Marine in the open, selfless service. He further demonstrated this uncommon valor by later refusing medical evacuation when he had the opportunity, offering his spot on the helicopter to another Marine. He stayed in the fight until he was later mortally wounded by an enemy sniper. We learned that Captain Robert Holt left high school, went to Phillips Academy up in Andover, played basketball for Duke, became a Marine, then a navigator for an F-4 Phantom Jet and was shot, over, shot down over Vietnam in 1968. His remains weren't recovered until nearly three decades later when he was brought home. We also learned that the, uh, the Hanscom family was notified of their son Jack's death. At that time, a future Vietnam veteran was playing in the house with their son, and he would later serve in Vietnam. Every one of these young men grew up in this town played in the same parks and went to the same schools as each one of us. Selfless service, valor, intrepid actions, and conspicuous gallantry are words used to describe the conduct of these forever young men. This also describes the millions who returned home, some of whom are here today with us. As you read these names and look at the pictures, I hope you're struck with the same sense of awe that I felt when I saw how young they were. Having led multiple commands overseas, I was always taken back when I saw the young age of the soldiers who served alongside me in combat. But they do grow up quickly. So please take a moment later on today and read the placards before you leave, and then take a look at your sons and daughters, and then say a quick prayer for both the warriors and their families. We cannot undo the pain caused by the thoughtless and despicable behavior exhibited towards our Vietnam veterans when they return home. But we can commit to never ever doing that again and recognize that no soldier ever chooses the war we fight. That difficult decision rightfully belongs to the civilians we elect. The 58,220 men and women who died in Vietnam, along with the 2.7 million who served there, and the millions of more who were deployed across the world, standing watch for this nation, did not make these decisions. They simply answered the nation's call to duty, just as Americans have done since Joshua Eaton did during the American Revolution, and they have earned our eternal gratitude. 
I would like to ask every veteran who served in Vietnam and veterans who served during the war that are here today to please stand so that we can officially welcome you home and give you the proper thank you you deserve. For every soldier, sailor, airman, marine who serves in combat, there's a family left behind that waits each day with dread, fearing a knock on the door from a uniformed member bringing the worst news a family could ever hear. Today, we have several families that received that knock and were notified that their marine or soldier was dead. We as a nation refer to these people as Gold Star families. And I would like to ask these people who are with us today, our Gold Star families, to please stand so that we can provide you our support and recognition for the, uh, for the sacrifice that you endured with the loss of your service members. So uh, could all the Gold Star families please rise for a moment. And finally, I'd like to express my appreciation to the, we call them Blue Star families, for the, for the warriors who went overseas, the families that remained behind and worried about them. Um, Jerry Mullen and her family are here. Her father did serve two tours in Vietnam, um, but he's unfortunately one of the gentlemen that uh, did not make it to this ceremony. So all the family members who had brothers, sisters, and parents that went to war, please stand so we can thank you. Now, I have the distinct honor, and as I shared a moment ago, the military rests, we stand on the shoulders of those who come before us. We learn from others, but we don't always just learn from the military leaders. And I have the distinct honor uh, to introduce our next speaker. From, as I mentioned, a lot of this institutional knowledge is built over time. And for me, it was the veterans of Vietnam who passed on these knowledge, these pieces of knowledge to me. I hopefully in turn passed those same pieces of knowledge on. And I, I had to divert for a minute because I ran into a gentleman today and this shows you the multi-generational piece of Reading where I learned from folks here. I hopefully passed it on. In the middle of a firefight in the, in the city of Fallujah in Iraq back in 2003, there was a young soldier sitting next to me and there was a break in the fighting for a second and I just looked over to break the ice and I said, where are you from? And he said, Reading, Mass. <laughs> what are the odds? <laughs> and so that young man was a buck sergeant in the Army. He came home and became a U.S. Army Green Beret. And he's here with us today, and he's retiring next month, and I'd just like to give a shout out to Sergeant Major Glenn McNulty, who's with us. But those lessons are not limited just to the military. They're often passed to the next generation by coaches and teachers. One such person is Hal Croft. Mr. Croft was a longtime resident of Reading, former member of the school committee. Hal was an esteemed teacher of English, and a coach at RMHS. During his tenure, as many of you know, the boys track and field, as the track and field coach, he did not lose a dual meet from 1971 to 2001. The streak is a nationally recognized record with 29 straight league titles and 252 conse consecutive dual meet victories. It's, something, it's amazing. As an unimpressive 200, 220 hurdler, who was less impressive with the discus on the 1979 team. I watched Coach Croft tirelessly work with each of our members of our team to maximize their potential. Our little town of Reading was not blessed with the fastest runners in the country. We just had the best coach. A man who committed to working with young people, instilling a sense of discipline that is re required to grow, and to teach them to reach for the stars. Each of these championship teams had a hundred or so members. And if you think about the cascading effect of 30 years of teams of a hundred that were growing and growing and learning about discipline, commitment to excellence, you, you get a, a sense and feel for this. Now, I don't want to paint too flowery a picture of Coach Croft. <laughs> and to say he could be a bit prickly is like saying the water off Kennebunk can get chilly. <laughs> Very few people back then knew that long before he was Coach Croft and Mr. Croft, the English teacher, Al Croft was a Marine. He left college, he had a deferment, waived it, joined the Marine Corps, and as a private first class and a rifleman with K Company, 3rd Battalion, 3rd Marines, in 1967 in Quang Tri Province, he earned both the Bronze Star Medal for Valor and the Silver Star Medal. 
as well as the Vietnamese Cross for gallantry. I would like to just ask Captain Bill Hughes to come forward and read the citation from the Silver Star for those who aren't familiar with it. Good morning. The President of the United States of America takes pleasure in presenting the Silver Star to Private First Class Harold Allen Croft, United States Marine Corps, for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity in action while serving as a rifleman with Kilo Company, 3rd Battalion, 3rd Marine Regiment, 3rd Marine Division, reinforced Fleet Marine Forces on 25 March 1967 in connection with operations against the enemy in the Republic of Vietnam. During a search and clear operation in Quang Tri Province, Private First Class Cross Unit was advancing across an open field when he observed eight North Vietnamese soldiers running toward a hedgerow. Reacting instantly, he opened fire on the enemy, but a sudden burst of intense automatic weapons and small arms fire from the hedgerow temporarily halted his unit's advance. Unhesitatingly and with complete disregard for his own safety, Private First Class Croft began maneuvering in an attempt to flank the entrenched enemy positions. With one, with one Marine providing cover, he adva advanced to within 10 meters of the North Vietnamese and began throwing grenades into the trench line. Although, although under heavy enemy fire, he daringly continued his advance, undaunted by an enemy round which struck his helmet. Despite determined North Vietnamese resistance, he ac accurately placed his grenades, enabling his squad to close with the enemy and destroy their positions. During the vicious firefight, he personally killed two North Vietnamese and wounded an undetermined number. As a result of his daring and heroic actions, his unit accounted for six enemy confirmed killed, four automatic weapons, two rifles, and numerous medical supplies and equipment captured. By his bold initiative, inspiring leadership, and unwavering dedication to duty at great personal risk, Private First Class Croft upheld the highest traditions of the Marine Corps and of the United States Naval Service. Following today's ceremony, the Reading Track will be dedicated in honor of Mr. Croft. Without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Coach Hal Croft. Well, I don't know whether I can do this or not. It's been a number of years before I've had to speak before a crowd and <clears throat> such a distinguished and happy and, let's say, pleased crowd as this one. You're listening to some extraordinary stories and uh, vignettes about what has happened to a good number of us. Uh, and I share a little of that with them. Brigadier General Jack Hammond said that he was oblivious while he was in high school. And I can't argue with that. <laughs> But at one point or another in the Gulf War, he was in charge of probably all of our services at the time, both in Iraq and Afghanistan. So you have a true American hero on this premises. And he continues it day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, and the man works with intrepid, intrepidity, see? <laughs> he works hard. <laughs> and, you know, I, I visited uh, home base, his offices, and they're extraordinary, and his services are de desired not only, you know, statewide, but nationally. Groups like home base start now and per perhaps the same with the same name. He does extraordinary things for people who have come home with varied injuries. This has precipitated since, since I was in Vietnam, 
And it's certainly not a great tsunami. It probably should be. It should be in a, perhaps a, a great washing of emotion for the people that we've lost. They've come back with post-traumatic stress disorder, and that is one heavy burden to carry, as Tim O'Brien wrote in The Things They Carry. Post-PTSD is a burden that you carry forever. I personally don't believe it can be cured. Jack's group helps us lighten that load. It helps us carry that load as long as we can. Earth carries approximately seven billion people. Good number of them, if you watch what we have to watch daily, undoubtedly have PTSD. It is a, another pandemic. May last, it may last longer than what we've already witnessed as a pandemic. pandemic. There's no vaccine for this disorder. Each and every one of you that has suffered stress yourself or in your family has found or, let's say, discovered a form of that disorder. And I like to call it a sentence, somewhat a life sentence, because we all move on in spite of what's happened to ourselves and our families, and we carry that deep in our hearts and in our psyches. <clears throat> PTSD's perpetual sentence has been protect projected on the screen of my mind for as long as I can remember, looking down on the six, actually that document is a little skewed, on the six North Vietnamese whom my platoon takes credit for having killed. Looking back on that, perhaps was the last day I would carry uh, my burden lightly. It stifled me, it stunned me, and I moved on, afraid to make friends because I didn't want to see that happen to them. That kind of friendship was impossible from there on. I was hesitant to be emotional. I had this sentence on my back, and it has stayed there. The, after, the aftermath of that rapid, rapacious <coughs> struggle will be in my psyche, behind my eyes, it's on the screen at the back of my skull, as long as I can carry it. Thereafter, 25, uh, one month to the day later, K33 moved up a hill entitled or in numbered 861. My company was assigned to clear the peak. There had been some supporting artillery, but not too much. And we slowly made it up <coughs> and made it towards the peak and the tree line that was up there. As we moved forward, that entire tree line exploded in our faces. There were 97 of us. <coughs> 27 were capable of walking down the next day. Fire everywhere, horrors which I probably shouldn't be mentioning now. And that was happening just to us during the time we were pinned down. We stayed there that night, and before the night settled, I did get a hold of a, a Coleman's bag, moved amongst the people I could help. 
there weren't many, and I failed. I had gone the opposite, into the opposite arena of trying to save somebody in a battlefield rather than kill them. And it didn't make any difference. I helped maybe two, and those two, I'm not sure, made it out. The fog settled in on us, we woke up the next morning, still the fog on, and it slowly burned off, and myself and three others were still there next to the tree line. Most people have been evacuated, but we had still at least one down in shock. And then with sec within half of a, or half an hour, upon finding the, there was one corporal up there badly uh, suffering simply from shock. Not physically, but simply from shock. And we hear the word all the time, oh, I'm shocked. No, you're not. This corporal was, as I was a little earlier, a month even before, somewhat stunned. But unable to speak or walk or move. The North Vietnamese spotted us. They knew we were out there. They'd been yelling at us all night. And we got mortared. And that shock was another that he couldn't handle. The other man up there with him <coughs> tried to move him and managed to pick him up and get him off of the hill. I wasn't up there alone, I don't think, but I did find another private off to my left who's, who had been hit by an RPG and lost his entire face and uh, picked him up and had to drag him down the hill because I had a couple of rifles and my own stuff and brought him down listening to his head bounce on the ground. Horrifying, but I carried it, and I moved persistently, and I didn't run. Simply got off of that hill. That hill became the hill that protected what we now know as Quezon, place of, place of massive siege. Went on for 66 or so days, hundreds died. Very much, at least those hours were better. Those last few hours were very much like must, what must have gone on. Places like Normandy and what I remember clearly in my youth, paying a lot of, a lot of attention to Iwo Jima. On Iwo Jima, 6,800 Marines died in 13 days. And can you imagine what the people at home had to bear and certainly carry in their psyches for the rest of their lives? Now we are currently, I, know what, I think I better hang this up on it, probably am venturing far on. We're also all needy, in need of, say, control of our minds. We're not, hopefully, paralyzed by media. But we do know that our futures, if to be content, if to be happy, rely on dealing with this certain pandemic, PTSD, right here at home. We see it in our schools, we see it in our colleges, we see it in supermarkets, and horribly we see it in grade schools indeed. And that's borrowed PTSD. You can see it now, and you can think you can walk away from it. And I don't think anybody here has been able to do that. We face that, and we will face it, whether we know it or not. It must become part of what we 
handle and take on as what we carry hereafter. <coughs> Thank you. And, and well, I did mean to be a little heavy this morning, but we made it. And good luck to Jack. Good luck to Brigadier, Brigadier General Jack in dealing with exactly what he spoke of and what I just spoke of. Our military is, can't be left alone dealing with PTSD. It seems to be invisible, and probably all of you know it isn't. We can't live in denial. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Croft. Thank you for those words. At this time, I noticed that we had a lot of veterans that uh, are here, Vietnam veteran, the era veterans, and you stood. I have, how many veterans here have not received the 50th anniversary present? Let me see you stand up, and please. Okay. What I'd like you to do, please stand up. The pin that is being handed out to these Vietnam veterans is to recognize and thank and honor the United States military veterans who served during the Vietnam War. The presentation of the pin and the symbolism, the eagle represents courage, honor, dedicated service to our nation. As one of the most recognizable and notable American symbols, it is emboldened with the distinction of the numerous military insignia. The blue circle. The color blue matches the canton of the American flag and signifies the vigilance, perseverance, justice, circle, shape. The blue color also matched the official seal of the commemoration. The laurel wreath, a time-honored symbol representing victory, integrity, and strength. The stripes behind the eagle represent the American flag. The stars, the six stars represent the six allies who served, sacrificed, fought alongside one another, Australia, New Zealand, the Philippines, the Republic of Korea, Thailand, and the United States. Thank you, General. And uh, thank you, Captain uh, Hughes. On the message on the uh, backside of the uh, pin, a grateful nation thanks and honors you, is imposed on the back. It's closest to the heart of the wearer. Also, the official name of the commemoration is included to remind each veteran that this is a national initiative and this lapel pin is the nation's lasting memento of thanks. Gentlemen, Vietnam veterans, welcome home, and thank you for your service. It is not unnoticed and or unrecognized. Thank you. At this time, Alex Holt, nephew of Robert Holt, will speak on behalf of the Holt family. Alex? So, um, Alex uh, Robert Holt. Um, I'm here with my, my mother, Barbara. Uh, my father, Richard, and my son, Noah. Um, my father is the class of 1963 here at Reading Memorial High School. Um, his brother, Captain Robert Allen Holt, um, was killed September 19, 1968. And I'm going to give a short remembrance of him. I'm honored to be here with all of you, with all the veterans as a civilian. thinking about what it means to remember somebody you never met. I was thinking about what it means to remember someone you never met. Standing at Reading Memorial High School, how do we remember? And I think the lesson for me is we don't forget. We don't forget the ultimate sacrifice. And so this memorial, I look forward to coming and visiting it often. Um, September 19th, 1968, uh, Captain John Lavu and my uncle, Captain Robert Holt, were flying in an F-4B Phantom II as part of the Marine Attack Squadron. The 554 Tigers, they were referred to, I believe, stationed in Da Nang. Uh, they were shot down. Uh, they were missing in action. Bob was 25, my uncle. Here in Reading, my dad was 23. His father, Cliff, was 51. His 
mom, Shirley, was 50. Just like that, life changed. They had a service at the Old South Methodist Church here in Reading. I sometimes think how hard that must have been. Um, I'm here today to celebrate Bob's life, to celebrate the courage and service and sacrifice that he made and that all people make who serve in the military. In 1992, the Department of, of Defense, the POW MIA Accounting Agency, did site excavation in Vietnam. I imagine what those years must have been like from 1968 to 1990s, missing in action. I'm, I'm, I wonder what that must have been like for my grandfather Cliff, maybe having some dream that Bob would be found. In 1999, they officially identified the remains of John LeVu, Captain John LeVu and Captain Robert Allen Holt, and they brought them home. There was a service at Forest Glen Cemetery here in Reading for my uncle on his 50, what would have been his 55th birthday. A month later, at Arlington Cemetery, there was a full military honor service for these two courageous men. In 2007, I was in Vietnam. I was teaching English and traveling. My family came over and we went to the site where my uncle's plane had crashed. We were with a translator and we pulled up to the site and there was a crater that was now a pond. And a gentleman came out of the house, probably 70 years old, and we learned from the translator, from the conversation, we told him why we were there, and, he said, and right away he started giving us hugs. Amazing. He had built a pagoda, a little altar, right next to the crater. And every month, as is the tradition in Vietnamese tradition, he would go and he would bring uh, food and place it on the altar because in his belief system that the dead would not rest until they were brought home and so he would go out every month and place at, at a significant cost to him every month he would place food and offerings to these dead men for their spirits their souls or whatever he believed it was that day that really changed my perspective on things. And lastly, I'm here with my son, who's eight years old. And in, he's in third grade last year. In second grade, they wrote an autobiography. And um, I didn't get to read it until the day I came into the school when he presented it. And he had one page on who's my inspiration in my life. Bob, his uncle Bob, was his inspiration. And so I hope um, I try to bring forward the courage that he had, the sacrifice he made and the service he had into my life today. And uh, I thank everyone who was part of building this memorial on behalf of my family. Um, thank you. Ms. Parmalee, would you like to come up and say a few words? Um, Thank you all. Thanks to the town of Reading and the people who worked so hard to, to do this. It means a lot. I was going to come tell you about my brother's heroism, but I don't have to try to get through that. The general did that. Thank you, general. <laughs> I do want to say a little bit about the Bruce that many of you knew, some of you knew. He was a great kid. About two inches taller than me. We were both thin then, and he was all arms and legs. And some people, who shall remain nameless, called him Spider. He hated that. <laughs> but it did fit him. He liked sports. He rooted for the Red Sox, the Celtics, the Bruins, and the Patriots. And he could hit to the opposite field unlike 
his little brother. In his last letter to me, he was really pissed with Elston Howard of the Yankees for breaking up Billy Roar's no-hitter with two out in the bottom of the ninth inning. That was a week before he died. So he didn't hold the grudge long. He was two months shy of his 21st birthday when he died, so he never cast a vote. He never had a drink, not legally anyway. <laughs> And he had started to smoke, which disappointed our mother. I'm sure Bruce felt he was just doing the right thing on that April day 55 years ago. There's nothing he could have done that would have been a truer example of who he was. Whether it was his little brother or a brother Marine, he was making sure that someone else was taken care of. That was my brother. That was Bruce. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite up Sharon Putney, sister to Edward Putney. Good morning. I'd like to thank all of you who have organized this enormous, wonderful tribute to the boys who lost their lives and to all the veterans here who served to help us stay free. I want to thank all of you who have kept um, Eddie's and the other boys' memories alive. For the, for the ones that have gone to the cemetery, who've, who've left flowers and tokens and mementos for um, the kind words, the postings on the email, um, all are very special and mean a lot. I'd especially like to thank um, the class of 1964, and Peter Murphy, and and uh, Dottie Richards Heselton, who's who led a um, uh, a campaign to raise scholarships for their classmates who lost their lives, and they did this for over 40 years. So I thank them. Uh, Eddie, uh, Eddie enlisted in 1968. He uh, went in with the commitment that he'd do the very best he could, and he became. He went to the head of his class, and he became a Green Beret. He was so proud to be a special in the special forces, but unfortunately, um, partway through his tour. The Army needed combat engineers, so they recruited 130 special forces, Eddie among them, to be squad leaders. And um, he was very disappointed, but he uh, continued to strive to do his best. Uh, online, several years later, one, of his, one member of his squad wrote that he was the most honorable, kind-hearted man that he ever knew and his squad would follow him to the gates of hell if he led them. It was quite a tribute. On letters home to me, he wanted to come home. He wanted to go back to school. Forestry was his love, and uh, he wanted to go into business. Our father, had bought, with Eddie's help, had bought him a white Corvette um, on his return. Eddie loves fast cars. And he wanted me to make him an uncle. And my son Jeffrey is with me today. Um, he also uh, was very, he also had uh, purple hearts. He had uh, from uh, shrapnel. And he told me not to tell mom because he didn't want uh, her to worry. He also told us that we could um, break in the Corvette for him. And I don't think I would have been that generous if somebody had given me a, a, a white cor convertible cor Corvette. It would be mine, uh, but, not, but not Eddie. Um, he was proficient in sweeping for mines, and he told me, uh, it's not too bad. I like to, th to blow up things. So um, he was OK with that. What he didn't like was jumping out of an airplane with a parachute. I think that, re that really scared him. Um, words that were said about him and the, his commendations were, was like uh, respected leader, 
extensive knowledge, quick to solve problems, um, went to the head of his class on tiring efforts, and well, you get the picture. On May 10th, 1969, and I think it was in Kuchi around Saigon, um, and he was, was killed. He was on his uh, last mission. His clothes had been sent home. The Corvette had been ordered. And he lost his life protecting his troop. The um, mission was successful, and for his efforts, he received the Silver Star. Uh, I'd like to read, because he was so proud, I just, he received many medals, and I'd just like to read um, all the honors that he received. From Vietnam, the, the um, Merit Medal, Gallantry Cross with Palm. From the Army, Sharpshooter, um, Expert Badge, Automatic Rifle, Parachute, um, uh, Vietnam Service Medal. Vietnam Campaign Ribbon, Expert Badge, <coughs> and Automatic Rifle, um, National Defense Service Medal, Commendation, Army Commendation Medal with two oak cl clusters, two Purple Hearts, a Bronze Star, and a Silver Star. In preparing for uh, my talk today, I have I keep Eddie's things including his hat, his green gray hat, in a um, chest. And when I went through it um, in the last couple of weeks, I remember the pain. I remember the sadness. I remember the tears, the forever tears. I remember the anger. Um, but going through it this time, I also remember the pride and I remember the love. And what I give to you, I hope all of you know the love. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Putney. Appreciate it. At, at this time, I'm going to read off the uh, roll of honor for the men that are on the memorial. Peter M. Bradbury, Private First Class, United States Marine Corps. And Craig, could you present the rose, please? Robert J. Krause, Lance Corporal, United States Marine Corps. John W. Hanscom, Private First Class, United States Marine Corps.
Michael D. Havel, Specialist, 5th Class, United States Army. Robert A. Holt, Captain, United States Marine Corps. Bruce C. Armory, Private First Class, United States Marine Corps. Edward A. Putney, Staff Sergeant, United States Army. At this time, I'd like to ask Roger Parmley and Richard Holt to step forward and place a wreath at the base of the memorial. At this time, can I ask Sharon Putney, sister of Sasso and Edward Putney, and Ray Boyd, Reading Vietnam veteran, to step forward? This time, the Reading Memorial High School band play America the Beautiful.
Let us pray. As we depart from here, may the creator and sustainer of all life bless our memories. As we pledge that the sacrifices of Peter, Robert, John, Michael, Robert, Bruce, and Edward will be remembered. And that to one of them we will work diligently for peace so that our children may know a world without war. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Volunteers, Brigadier General Jack Hammond, Marine Corps Captain Bill Hughes, the Veteran Memorial Fund, Mr. Bill Brown and Raymond Boyd, Department of Public Works, Ted Jeff Cummings and his crew who prepared this site during the hottest times of the summer this past summer. Thank you. And the countless number of my co-workers who contribute substantially today's summer amount. Thank you all. Thank you. A special thank you goes out to the Reading resident, Dave DiFilippo, president and owner of Woodland Memorials of Everett, Mass. Through his generosity and expertise, this memorial and the benches that you see were manufactured in Vermont and transported here to this site where they were erected by his two sons and his employee the other day. And I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart for making this such a wonderful event. I also want to thank my predecessor, Veteran Service Officer Kevin Bowmiller, Commander, United States Navy, retired, who gave me the marching orders to get this project done. It was my privilege, sir, to carry out your directive. Thank you to the residents of Reading who came out to honor these veterans today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. This concludes our ceremonies will be followed by another dedication to Hal Croft down at the track. So please stay and go down for the uh, dedication. Thank you one and all. 